April of 2015, Fairwind's chief engineer Arnie Gunderson and the Fairwind's crew headed to Quebec City for the World Uranium Symposium. Attended by more than 300 delegates from 20 countries that produce uranium for nuclear power and weapons, the symposium brought together experts who are calling on governments throughout the world to end all uranium mining. In this presentation, Part 2, The Economics of Nuclear Power, Michael Schneider, an independent international energy and nuclear policy consultant, provides an economic analysis of the cost of nuclear power, including data using charts and graphs. Thanks very much. I uh, will now uh, talk uh, about nuclear issues, which is a lot less, um, well, how shall I say, um, light than uh, theater or uh, self-managed uh, youth hostels. Uh, what we try to do with the World Nuclear Industry Status Report, is, which is an annual publication now, is to, to give a broad overview of uh, the, the industry in the world, um, to, to provide sort of a carpet for discussion. The nuclear issue is an issue which a lot of people discuss uh, without knowing much about it. And <clears throat> I think there are, very, uh, there are a lot of controversial points but one should get into controversy once one had agreed on the basis. That's absolutely crucial. So what we try to do is exactly that, provide a carpet for debate. It's always important if you talk any kind of energy issues to look at the entire movie over a long period of time. If you look at a pho photograph, it doesn't tell you anything because it changes so, it can change so dramatically from one to the other year that you have to assess developments over long periods of time. What we have here is reactor startups in the world uh, in green and in red reactor shutdowns. Uh, so you can, you can see if you <coughs> only look at the, the last part of the story, you miss actually the most significant parts of the history when there were large waves of reactor startups in the 1970s and the 1980s. But from the end of the 1980s onwards, it's pretty flat. So the red and the green startup shutdown is basically uh, uh, very similar. So in cumulated terms, what does that provide us with? Uh, it's a situation where we have this uninterrupted rise uh, until the, the end of the 1980s, uh, with the first stop of that rise in 1989, and from then on really a flat situation uh, until this event in 2011 in Japan which of course had a dramatic impact on the numbers of operating nuclear power plants in the world. Now we thought that you know when when you look at international statistics of the International Atomic Energy Agency or any governmental statistics they don't show that because the, the reactors in Japan are officially still in operation. Now, which is quite amazing because there's no reactor generating electricity since September 2013. So that's a year and a half without any uh, kind of uh, generation of nuclear electricity. And in 2013, only two reactors generated electricity. But the official statistics say 48 reactors in operation. We, th we think that's quite misleading. So what we did is we created a new category that we call long-term outage. So the reactors that are not officially being abandoned or shut down, but that have not generated electricity for the entire year uh, before we release our report, and for the time within the, for the first half of the current year, we call them in long-term outage. So we take them out of the statistics of operating reactors. We think that is much closer to reality than uh, the uh, international official statistics. So if we look at the, the situation, the same image for the 28 countries of the European Union, you get a very similar development pattern uh, until the end of the 1980s. When I say development pattern, you look at these graphs in terms of shapes, you know, one, it's, it's important to understand what goes up, what goes down, what is big, 
what is small, much more than a, a, a figure. Figures you can debate. Is it, is it uh, 177 or was it 178? It doesn't make a difference to understand trends. This is trend analysis, so we, we're trying to look at the big picture. Uh, and it's very clear here, the message. It's had the same development pattern un until the end of the 1980s, but from then on, it's pretty different, right? From then on, we have a decline, very clear decline. Uh, and today we have uh, 47 nuclear reactors less in operation than at the peak time at, at the end of the 1980s. Just keep that in mind when you read that there is one reactor under construction in France, one reactor under construction in Finland, and two reactors under construction more or less in Slovakia and Europe. It's irrelevant to this trend. Entirely irrelevant. It doesn't change anything. You wouldn't even see those, those reactors when they come online because more reactors get actually closed than start up. So th that's, that's the idea. Look at the trends. Now, uh, we've seen that the, the numbers of reactors are operating. So they, when they operate, they generate electricity. There's 31 countries in the world that generate nuclear electricity. But this picture shows very clearly that we don't have a pattern where it's spread out over the 31 countries. Uh, on the contrary, it's very much concentrated uh, to a large, uh, to a concentrated to a small number of countries. So roughly, for many years, it's been the, the top five that have been generating approximately two thirds of the nuclear electricity in the world. In fact, two countries, the U.S. and France, generate approximately half of the nuclear electricity in the world. Or said differently, one country, France, generates about half of the elect nuclear electricity in the European Union. So those are the orders of magnitude to understand what the significance is. Now the other thing we did is we tried to understand how does the maximum generation of electricity develop over time. So we looked at the peak generation of electricity historically per country. So this is the lighter color here. So, and it's not really surprising that we find Japan, that was actually a big player a few years ago, move back, uh, you know, uh, practically to, to uh, de facto to zero uh, gener nuclear generation. This is still for 2013, so there was a little bit of nuclear generation yet. Uh, the other country that I uh, is remarkable, particularly remarkable, is Germany, was also a big player until uh, um, 3.11 when it decided to phase out nuclear power entirely by 2022 uh, and had uh, shut down immediately 8 of 17 uh, reactors. But you can also see that you know, a number of other countries have actually the lighter part is higher than the red or blue part. So the historical generation was actually higher than what they have done in 2013 or 2012. That was number of reactors, generation of nuclear electricity. Um, and uh, so we look here at the absolute uh, generation of electricity, which you can see actually continued to rise until 2006. And then it declined. And obviously we see the, the, the Fukushima effect from 2011 onwards. But the most remarkable part here is actually the relative share of nuclear power in the world's commercial electricity generation. And when you look at that, you realize that the peak was actually achieved already 20 years ago uh, in, uh, in the middle of the 1990s. And from then on, we see you know, a steady, slow, but steady decline. That decline had only been accelerated at the end of this graph after the, after the events in, in Japan. So th that is the first important lesson here. We, uh, Fukushima did not trigger any crisis in the, um, in the nuclear industry. It accelerated a pre-existing decline. And very much to the contrary to what you can usually read in the papers or, or see on television. Now, if you try to understand where, where this 
this travel is going. Um, one of the criteria to look at is obviously the number of reactors uh, under construction. Um, so this is the historical, you know, over the entire history of uh, nuclear constructions, the number of units that were at some point listed as under construction. And, you know, the industry loves to show a graph from 2005 to 2015. <coughs> That's very neat, you know, because you, indeed, we, Jesus, we have like doubling the number of reactors under construction. So that's a very, you know, significant increase, which is true. It's not negligible. But what does, that does not tell is that in 2005, the number of reactors under construction was so low that you have to go back to the beginning of the nuclear age to find an, an equivalent low number of units under construction. Far from sufficient to actually provide the turnover to, you know, bring online as many reactors uh, that are being closed down. And we see that even over the past years, we, we again, we see a decline in, in numbers. So that trend doesn't seem to, you know, be prolonged uh, uh, much. Who are the players? Well, it's quite simple. There's actually only one. And this is China. Uh, China has 38% um, uh, of the 23 of a total of 61 reactors under construction. So it's, it's a, this is the only big player. The other countries like Russia with eight, India with six, US with five, South Korea with th uh, four, all the other countries only have one, one site, like either one or two reactors under construction. Uh, the other thing which is really interesting is if, if you look at this, uh, this um, column here, which gives you the construction start, because you find some interesting dates here. 1983, that's quite a while ago huh, to have started. But the absolute record holder is in the United States, Watts Bar 2 started construction in 1972. They had planned to finish it in, in 2012, which would have been nice, you know? It's like 40-year project, <laughs> <laughs> round figure, you know? But it didn't exactly work out, and it's, um, you know, I don't know. Now they say maybe this year, maybe not, uh, so um, speculations are open. But there's also other countries, you know, like, uh, I was mentioning Slovakia earlier, you know, it's 30 years in the statistics as under construction. Uh, Ukraine, 1986-87. Uh, so we see that, that many of these projects, in fact, there's eight that have been listed there for over 20 years. Um, <coughs> and we did a, a very detailed assessment and we, we realized that uh, there, there are now at least those are substantiated. At least 49 of these are delayed. And when I'm saying delayed, it can be anything from several months to many years. Um, so it's, it's a global phenomenon. Now the other thing I wanted to attract your attention on this slide is that you see the, the lighter colors here are actually units that had been in the statistics at some point but were abandoned. In nuclear history, it's over 250 reactor orders that have been canceled. So a unit that is listed as under construction, there's no guarantee whatsoever that this will actually be uh, finished uh, and generate electricity at some point. Keep that in mind. Now, in the absence of large uh, uh, new build programs, it is clear that the, the average age of the current fleet increases constantly we can basically always add a year. You know, we don't even have to, to calculate. It, it, when we calculate it a year later, it's a, the fleet is a year older, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing. So currently it stands uh, um, at about 29 years. That's the, the average age of the, the reactors operating. I don't know, there's people here that, that weren't even born then, but uh, if you remember the car that you've been driving 30 years ago, that was another technological <coughs> age, right? I mean, it's a very different technology uh, today. So these are old machines, very old machines. So at half, almost half of the reactor fleet is now operating for 30 years and more. This is particularly problematic because the the market situation of nuclear power is getting increasingly um, complicated. 
Can you just give me a time check? Please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and this is really something, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but it's something I'm very much concerned about. Because what we see today is that, that the economic situation of the operating utilities is, is in terrible state. Uh, so <coughs> one of the reasons, or one of the few blips I wanted to give you here is a, a few case studies uh, where the market prices, so the, 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 the bulk rate for electricity, barely or not, is not covering anymore the, the cost. In Belgium, uh, uh, GDF Suez uh, filed a court case against the government and lost the case. Um, they they <coughs> were fighting a fuel tax, which they said could drive them over the edge of profitability if they have to pay it. They lost it. So uh, they, they made a statement where they said, now um, we are keeping all uh, options open, which means shutting down reactors much earlier than anticipated because they're not profitable anymore. In Sweden, we have seen data that illustrates that at least three reactors were not making any money, were losing money, two out of four years. Uh, and with the new government announcing a 17% a tax increase can have a similar effect as in, in Belgium. Um, in, in Germany, you know, Germany, as I mentioned before, has a nuclear phase-out program, so a, a by and by shutting down of the remaining nine reactors. Uh, the uh, utility E.ON decided to shut down one reactor seven months earlier than required by law. Why? Because it's not making any money. It's impossible to actually um, uh, make a profit with that machine. And finally, in the U.S., as you, as you probably know, they, there were five shutdown decisions. After, after a situation where I think for 15 years there was no movement, uh, no, no reactor startups, no shutdowns. The uh, utilities announced in one year five shutdowns for very similar reasons, including two reactors that were actually licensed to operate beyond 2030. So that means that uh, the traditional utilities, not only nuclear ones, but in particular nuclear ones, are under increasing pressure. And it's, it's, the situation is so bad uh, that to illustrate that, the 20 largest uh, uh, energy utilities in, in the European Union lost about half of their stock value since 2008. Now that's half a trillion euros, half 500 billion euros. It's a huge amount of money uh, that is, uh, that is <coughs> lost in capital value. Um, so th there is a real uh, situation of crisis. Uh, one example, because it's the largest nuclear uh, country in terms of percentage generated from nuclear power in the electricity mix, but also because uh, EDF, EDF, Electricité de France, is the largest nuclear operator in the world with 58 nuclear reactors. And Arriva uh, is the largest or one of the largest nuclear builders uh, in the world and integrated nuclear companies doing basically everything from uranium mining, and I'm sure many of you are aware that Arriva is very active in this country, uh, to um, uh, waste management. So they do the in entire, entire chain, uh, fuel chain. So both companies are 85% uh, or 87% for Arriva owned by the government. So people always thought, well, what can happen to a government-owned company, right? I mean, uh, not much. Well, not exactly. The problem is that the operating costs uh, in France increased in, in dramatic ways over the past few years. Um, the regulator, the energy regulator in France has calculated that uh, the loss in one year in 2012 was about 1.5 billion because the income from tariff sales, from kilowatt hour sales, did not cover the costs anymore, which, which incidentally is illegal in France. So there's no other choice but to increase rates or to reduce costs. Reduce costs is not to do because, uh, on the contrary, old reactors, lack of investment over the past few years, so costs are increasing. So there's no other choice but to increase tariffs. 
Uh, the, the stock value, and we'll come back to that, plunged significantly um, over the past few years. And the debt load of this company is now 34 billion euros. I mean, 34 billion euros is really a very large uh, number. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, this is about... Uh, there they were, they were months-long discussions with the European Union and uh, the French government to authorize a deficit, a budget, state budget deficit beyond 3%. 3% is the, is the legal, European legal limit. And France didn't make it. And they, they requested um, an, uh, the authorization uh, to, to go to 4%. Um, to to, um, that difference between 3 and 4%, I calculated, is about 11 billion euros. 11 billion euros for the state uh, deficit. So we're talking here for the debt of this utility three times that amount. So people that think, well, you know, the gov government is just going to bail out uh, EDF or bail out Arriva, it's not going to work like that. There is no money to bail out. Um, Arriva's situation is even worse. Arriva is uh, is technically bankrupt. There's absolutely no doubt. This company lost 8 billion uh, in, in four years uh, with uh, a capital of something like 3.5 billion and a debt load of over 5.8 5 uh, billion uh, euros. So this, this company is de facto bankrupt. And it was downgraded to junk by Standard & Poor's uh, in November last year and downgraded again since. So here we see the, the stock price development of EDF, largest nuclear uh, operator in the world. While the, this is a national indicator, you always have to put it against an indicator because an economic crisis leads to all companies going downhill and it doesn't tell you anything. So a good indicator is like the NASDAQ or other, other national indicators. If you do that for France, this is what gives the difference between the state-owned company and the, the 40 largest companies uh, in France. You look at the Arriva case, this is what it gives. So it's dramatic, absolutely dramatic <coughs> in terms of uh, loss of value. Now, just a few words <coughs> on, um, we, we always have a sort of a, a, a 10 page section, 15 page section in the report on the comparison between nuclear and renewable energy developments. Mm -hmm. So what we did here is we, we have in blue uh, wind energy uh, capacity, generating capacity development in green, it's, it's uh, solar pho photovoltaics, and in, uh, in red, it's nuclear. And this is since uh, the year 2000. So the changes, the capacity change since 2000. So we have a less than in year 2000 for nuclear, and we have a huge increase in wind and solar. Obviously, the capacity doesn't tell you the whole story. You have to look at the generation of electricity. But even in electricity terms, and here we looked at starting 1997. You remember, 97 was the signing of the Kyoto Protocol. So we wanted to know what since the Kyoto Protocol actually was generated in addition by nuclear, wind, or solar. And the result is really staggering <coughs> because you see that, that um, um, the, the, the electricity generated added <coughs> since 97 by wind is about five times as much as nuclear. And even photovoltaics just caught up with, with nuclear, which is quite a, an impressive uh, uh, result. Uh, China um, is the, the most amazing uh, uh, country in terms of renewables development, because the thing is China doesn't only do nuclear, they, um, they do a lot more renewables than they do nuclear. Uh, they invested already five times more in 2010 in renewables than in, in nuclear. So the result is here. In, um, in uh, the, the cap capacity addition by photovoltaics paced out in 2013 uh, uh, nuclear additions. And here's production. So wind alone generates more power in China now since 2012 than, than nuclear in spite of that large building program because of the time factor. It's just much faster to implement. So um, to conclude this 
I mean, you can read this, but uh, they, the, you can read faster than I can read, uh, tell you this. But uh, the basic message is we have a situation where the global nuclear industry has been in crisis and in a decline trend for many years. This is, has nothing to do with Fukushima. It's um, merely an acceleration of a pre-existing trend. The second thing is that uh, it's important to understand, and I'm very concerned, that the economic and financial situation of the uh, operating companies is so bad and so problematic that this will have an effect on safety. Can you imagine a company that is technically bankrupt, like Arriva, is operating the planet's most dangerous place, which is La Hague, the La Hague reprocessing facility uh, in, in, in Normandy in France, which has the largest radioactive inventory. Uh, the, the spent fuel that is stored there is equivalent to over 100 reactor cores uh, with, without any, any kind of uh, protection. It's like basically steel roofs, um, you know, no, no major protection. Um, that company has 50 tons of plutonium on the site. So a company that has announced that they want to get rid of 500 people on that site because of economic pressure, 500 people? What did they do until now? Fishing or, you know? I mean, how, how is it possible that you can get rid of 500 jobs on a site like that, of maybe 3,000? So I'm very concerned, and the same is true, of course, for the utility EDF, but it's also true for in other countries. The utilities are under enormous pressure, and that will have consequences on safety. On the other hand, uh, and, and that's my final point, uh, it's, it's very clear that we're in the middle of an energy revolution. Uh, not at the beginning. We're right in the middle. We just <coughs> didn't get it yet. Uh, because uh, the, the economic feasibility today of renewables is such that they're fully competi competitive with other sources in many regions and countries in the world already. But it will be a, a game changer over the, uh, within the next five years in most of the, of the countries of the planet. So what I think is that uh, we have to be very careful, we're very aware of the pressures that exist on one hand, and on the other hand, on the opportunities that, opportunities that come up on the other hand. Thank you very much. For your